So we're uh, picking up where we left off last time. Jamie introduced uh, the, uh, the whole discussion of Jesus as our high priest. It's, it's been mentioned a couple of times, talked about it towards the end of chapter 4, and then gets in it into chapter 5, and we're going hit to hit some uh, key points about that. And then there's an interruption at verse, uh, verse 11 of chapter 5, and we pick up the discussion again in, ch in chapter 7, and we'll talk more about that. Um, good to see everyone out. Uh, before we get started, let's go to God in prayer. Dear God and Father, we're humbled, we're thankful that we can gather here as your children and, and pay homage and reverence and respect to your most holy word. We pray, Lord, that you'd be with us in our study this evening, that our faith will be increased, that we will be better equipped to, to understand the, the deeper meanings of your word and that we can apply them to our life. We just pray, Lord, that you'd help us to follow in the steps of Jesus as we learn and grow in, about him and, and the way he lived and the way he reigns today. We pray, Lord, you'd be with the, the sick of our number, struggling with illness and treatments and difficulties. Be with them, bless them, comfort them and their families. Watch over us, forgive us our sins. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, so this is kind of our uh, roadmap or outline for our discussion this evening. We're going to be talking about uh, qualifications of a high priest and how the Old Testament system compares to what God has established with Jesus. And then uh, talk about what happened with the Hebrews in terms of maturity. This, this expression you're going to see not only in this chapter but in other chapters that Jesus was a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. And we're going to be introducing that and talking about that this evening. All right, can I get a volunteer to read this first slide? Verses 1 through 5, Hebrews 5. Okay, go ahead, John. Every high priest is selected from among the people and is appointed to represent the people in matters related to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sin. He is able to deal greatly, gently with those who are ignorant and are going astray, since he himself is subject to weakness. This is why he has to offer sacrifices for his own sins, as well as for the sins of the people. And no one takes this honor on himself, but he receives it when called by God, just as Aaron was. In the same way, Christ did not take on himself the glory of God becoming a high priest, but God said to him, you are my son, today I have become your father. Okay. Who wants to take the next five verses? Volunteer. Okay, go ahead. As he saith also in another place, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Chesedek. Melchizedek. Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him, that was able to save him from death, and was heard in that he feared. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience of the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Called of God and high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Okay, thank you. So, repeats this expression twice. Is that because we're just kind of slow of hearing? Oh, no, it's importance, right? And and so the first five verses really talks about the the priesthood under the Old Testament system, the priesthood of Aaron. And then the second part talks about the priesthood of Christ. And, and so kind of our first question here is, why does the writer need uh, to address the qualifications of a high priest? Don't the Jews know that already? 
Why is he addressing it here? What's, it, what's, he, what's his roadmap? What, he, what is he trying to do? Yeah. Tie them to, uh, to Christ, because he had the qualifications and they could compare in that sense. Okay, all right, that's good. If we put ourselves in the place of a Jew for just a minute, and you think about Jesus, what tribe was he from? Judah. Judah. Where do the priests come from? You see the problem? <laughs> so he's hitting this right off the gate. So how can Jesus Christ be our high priest when he wasn't from the tribe of, of Levi? That's the problem. And so we kind of have to think, think as, as a Jew would think about things like this. And, and I mean, this, this letter is to the Hebrews. Who are they? Jews. And so, so he's really hitting this point home really hard. And, and so previous in our, our chapter, there was discussion about, you know, Jesus superior to the prophets, angels, Moses, Joshua, and now we see Aaron. And, but a lot of people put Jesus on the same par as them. I mean, think about it for just a minute. Back in Matthew 17, the transfiguration. His disciples were there. They saw Moses, Elijah, and Jesus was there. What did they want to do? They wanted to build three. Why? Because Jesus was on par with Elijah, the prophets, and Moses, the great leader. And this, this thinking was among the disciples. It's also, it was also among the Jews. So, uh, But we see that Hebrews is focused on the superiority of Jesus over all them, over everything. And the other thing that he's really hitting hard here, and it's, it was a problem that plagued the New Testament church, and it was people taking the Old Covenant and binding it up on the Gentiles. The, the book of Galatians, the letter to the Galatians, and Acts chapter 15, you remember they had that big controversy in the, in the church. Unless you're circumcised, you can't be saved. So this, this was a big problem in the church. And so the, this letter here to the Hebrews really spells out plainly the arguments of why Jesus is greater than all that. A any other thoughts on this before we move on? Make sense? All right, let's keep going. Oh. Okay, so, so we think about the qualifications of, you know, being a priest under the Old Testament system. What are the qualifications? I've got a couple up here. What are, what are the qualifications that we read about here? Hebrews chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. To be a high priest, what did you have to do? Yeah. Be a man. Okay. But not just a man. You had to be from the tribe of Levi. And no one else could be appointed. Who appointed the high priest? Under the Old Testament system. The people did. And, and so, it, it chosen from among men. That's what it says here in uh, verse 1. And what was their function? What was a high priest supposed to do? Okay. Sacrifices, minister to the people. They had a function. They, there was something they had to do. What else? What else do we read here? Don't be shy. Okay. But not only for the sins of the people, but for his own sins, which is very important. And, um, you know, he fleshes this out even more uh, in future chapters. But um, now it was important for the high priest to be of man. Um, so that, it says here, so that 
the high priest could ha would have compassion. How, how could the high priest have compassion with the people? Just like the people. Just like everyone else. And this is an important point when we start talking about, well, how's that compared to Jesus? Well, he was in the flesh. We just read it back in chapter 4 that, you know, he understands, he knows what it's like to be tempted. He was a man, but he was God in the flesh. And so, again, just drawing these comparisons. <clears throat> oh. The last one I have up here is appointed of God, not self-chosen uh, by men. And, and so you had to be of Aaron, you had to be the sons of, you had to be in the lineage of, but Jesus was appointed by God just like Melchizedek was. Okay, so this is where he, he kind of gets into this whole discussion about Melchizedek. And anything else on this before we move on? I wanted to introduce this idea or thought uh, before we get too far, I don't, can you read that? Uh, it's kind of small. But uh, he talks about some points here about Jesus and him being perfectly qualified to be our high priest. A few things are mentioned here, but it's going to really get fleshed out even more in future chapters in, in, in Hebrews. This, this is a key point of the book of Hebrews. And so, we're going to start seeing types and antitypes and the, the tabernacle in heaven and Christ ministering as high priest in heaven. And so he's going to start making these comparisons, but I just wanted to introduce these kind of things or ideas to you. Jesus was divinely chosen, and it talks about it here. He even goes back to Old Testament passages pointing out what God's intent was for Jesus. So he was divinely chosen, divinely appointed. Uh, he was the actual sacrifice as opposed to the blood of bulls and goats and animals. And he was the final victor. And, and so there's no need for a sacrifice. Jesus made that on our behalf. And he was a perfect substitute for man. He was the, called the Lamb of God. So he, he was our sacrifice, offered only once for our sins. He doesn't have to repeatedly go on the cross and die every year. There doesn't have to be sacrifices. And now he's in the heavenly tabernacle, um, and the, the veil has been rent, representing that separation between God and man and between Jew and Gentile. Uh, Jesus tore that down. So I just wanted to get these, these kind of ideas in our mind as we uh, keep going. Any, anything else on this? Other thoughts, ideas? All right. Uh, what does the fact that he is God's son and that he was raised from the dead have to do with his priesthood? What do you think? Why is that important? Scratching your head, kind of trying to figure that out. Go ahead, Phil. Reigns evermore. Okay, all right. Uh, not like the past sacrifice. What happened to the, the high priest under uh, the Old Testament system? until they died. And then there was another one, and another one. But for Jesus to be re resurrected, to die no more, that's the point. He's a high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek, which we'll get into. So, so it's, it's very tightly woven in, in this whole idea of why he was divinely chosen. He was the perfect solution. There was nothing else. We couldn't we couldn't do anything for ourselves. We needed something else. And so God provided uh, Jesus 
as that priest. Anything else on that? Yeah, go ahead, Dwight. Yeah, it had to be a perfect sacrifice, one with no sin. Scripture talks about we've all sinned. How can we be sacrificed for anything? We have sin. Yeah. Never was, but knows what it's like to go through trials and to be tempted. And to go through suffering and pain. He understands what it's like for us and can sympathize with us. Uh, John, did you have? Go ahead. The distinction, too, is looking at the, the old law that the blood and sacrifice came from bulls and imperfect animals, and even the, the priest himself had a sacrifice for his own sin. Jesus was perfect, and he lived a perfect life, and he died on a cross not for his sins, but someone else's sins. Yes. So there's, there's the, where it gets into the better, if you will, of Jesus. And that, that's fleshed out a little bit more in, in future chapters in Hebrews, how that we're under a better covenant, uh, not under the old covenant. Anything else on this? Okay. Oh, I went too far. Okay, so there's a passage here uh, referring back to the Old Testament, uh, uh, Psalm 2 and verse 7, where it says, I will declare the decree the Lord has said, said to me, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And so the question is, how do we know he's talking about the resurrection? In this messianic psalm, Psalm 2, He's talking about Jesus Christ and his resurrection. How do we know that? If you go over to Acts chapter 13 for just a minute, the Bible answers its own questions. Isn't that interesting? Acts chapter 13, uh, verse 33. Paul is uh, preaching in the sermon... Uh, at Antioch and Presidia. And this is what he says in part of this passage. This he, talking about Jesus Christ, God, has fulfilled uh, to us their children by raising Jesus as is written in the second psalm, you are my son, today I have begotten you. See how simple that is? We know he's talking about the resurrection. Did David know he was talking about it? Probably not. But God in his infinite wisdom has laid all these landmarks through his word that point to the New Testament and point to Jesus. And, and this psalm here really is talking about how Jesus is not only resurrected, but if you look further down in this verse, it says... I will give you the holy and sure blessing. And, and then he talks about uh, Jesus uh, reigning in, in that psalm. And so, like Melchizedek, who was a priest and a king, Jesus is a priest and a king. And that's what these, these psalms were talking about and pointing to Jesus. Anything else on this? Hopefully that makes sense. Before Moses, yes. Eternal, there was no beginning, no end. No end. And uh, good point. And so, this was all a part of God's plan. I mean, you, you remember going all the way back to Genesis chapter 3, in verse 15, he, he says that, talking about Jesus, and his, his son, we know now because we can see the passages in the New Testament that refer to it. You know, I will bruise your head and he will what? Bruise your heel. Talk about Satan and talk about Jesus uh, conquering sin. And that's what Galatians uh, focuses on as well. So let's look at this for a little bit. What does it mean that uh, Christ is priest according to the order of Melchizedek? We talked about a few things. Uh, 
met Abraham and he was without beginning, without end, no no parents. There was no lineage. There was no ancestry. There was no record of his birth or even his death. Uh, there's no, no ancestry. And um, there's no genealogy. We just, we just see in Genesis chapter 14 that Abraham encounters Melchizedek, who was a priest of the God Most High, king of Salem. And... How do we know that Abraham recognized him as this important figure in, in God's plan? What did he do? He, he, he tithed. He gave him a tenth. Where did Abraham get that idea? I mean, have you ever thought about that? I mean, tithing is a part of the old covenant. But it wasn't brought into being. But he just knew that that was what you did. And so, so he recognized how important uh, Melchizedek was as a priest and a king. And, um, and in your uh, material, there's a little chart that Jason has in there. If you look at it, it, it shows Melchizedek, who is a, a priest over all. Then it splits, and it goes to... Aaron, the priesthood of Aaron, who was over just the Jews. And then you have the Gentile tract. There was no priest for the Gentiles. And then it comes back to Jesus, priest and king over all, just like Melchizedek. And that simple little picture really, you know, kind of helps, I think, piece it all together. And... Um, and we see the infinite wisdom in God's plan when we think about Melchizedek. Did God know that he was going to bring Jesus according to the order of Melchizedek? Way back when. He had a plan. I mean, that, that should blow our mind to think about how God has this infinite wisdom and can think about those things well in advance. Anything else on this before we get going? All right. And then there's another reference uh, going back to uh, Hebrews 5 uh, from Psalm 110, another messianic psalm. And it says this. It says, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And earlier in that psalm, it talks about him sitting at the right hand. So he's not only a priest, but he's a king. Again, talking about Jesus in Psalms that were, you know, 2,000 years before it happened. And so, I mean, uh, you know, not 2,000. It was even more than that. But um, it, it's, it's thousands of years after that that it was fulfilled. So... Um, anything else on that one? That one's, I think, fairly straightforward. Okay. There's this reference uh, in, in going back to Hebrews five uh, about uh, Jesus and prayers and cries and tears in the days of his flesh. And and so, what's the point that you think is being made here? There's probably a couple. But what do you think? What's the point? He felt things like you and I would feel things. And he had to rely on God the Father to get him through. Okay. But he went through it that you and I went through. Okay. So he, 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 uh, he's compassionate. He understands what it's like being human. We see the humanity of Jesus. If we go back to the Garden of Gethsemane, I don't know if this passage is referring to that, but we clearly see the humanity of Jesus. Let this cup pass from me, nevertheless not my will, but yours be done. I mean, he understands what it's like to be human. Yet he was without sin. And 
What was one of the qualifications of being a high priest? You had to be a man. He was. And so I think part of the point here is proving the humanity of Jesus, that he was human. He was a man. He wasn't like a ghost or some figment of, you know, your imagination. But he was a man. Again, hitting these qualifications that makes Jesus that fully, perfectly qualified high priest. Anything else on this? There's other examples of Jesus and his humanity. Uh, but I think this one really, you know, is the one that a lot of people think about. Anything else on this? Okay. There's a reference here in uh, chapter 5 about um, he was heard by God because of his godly fear. What do you think that means? He was heard by God by his godly fear. What do you think? Was it because he was afraid to die? No, I don't think so either. What? What do you think he's talking about? There's two thoughts here about God's will in general or about being resurrected. We don't know, but all we know is Jesus demonstrated godly fear, which is the same kind of fear we should have for him. In the Old Testament, when you hear the word fear, the, in the New Testament, the word is love. Th those are the, you know, loving God, godly fear, they're connected. The Old Testament talks about fearing God and keeping his commandments. New Testament, we see a lot of loving God and keeping his commandments. But they both are really kind of talk about the same thing. Anything else on that? Yep, go ahead. Go, go ahead, Cheryl. Well, um, in mine it says um, he, he was heard because of his reverence. So the reverence kind of makes him more clear, too. Yeah, yeah. And that's a part of fearing God and, and loving. Go ahead, John. Respect. Respect. Okay. All right. And then there should be this, like, big stop sign. Because he's going to put the pause button on this discussion about Jesus and his high priesthood and being after, uh, according to the order of Melchizedek. And he, he's going to address what, you know, sometimes a good writer knows how people think and knows, wait a minute, maybe people are getting lost here. Maybe their minds aren't in the right place. And so he kind of interrupts this, this uh, discussion here and he talks about the Hebrews' lack of maturity. And uh, so that's what we want to uh, draw our attention to now. Um, anyone want to read this, uh, 11 through 14, volunteer? Go ahead, Phil. About this we have much to say, and it's hard to explain, since you'll become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles and oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. Okay. And so he, he's... You know, he's obviously warning against apostasy and, and immaturity, and, and he gets into this. I mean, even though there's a chapter 6 and a break there for, in chapters, the thought just goes on until you get to chapter 7. And so, um, so that'll be for uh, next week's lesson. Uh, Casey's got that. But, you know, as, as we think about this for just a little bit, in what sense were the Hebrews dull of hearing? Have you ever had somebody tell you, you're not listening to me? You're not hearing what I'm saying? 
But you got two ears for a reason, right? Two ears and one mouth for a reason. <laughs> we we got to listen better. And sometimes we just don't listen. We're not, you know, maybe we have some biases or uh, we're not letting somebody finish and we're jumping over here and our mind's not really paying attention and listening. Does that ever happen to you? I mean, you get older and a lot of times you need hearing aids. My dad does. I'm sure I'm going to have to have one at some point. And um, we're not talking about a physical, uh, you know, being dull of hearing. We're talking about a mental, spiritual uh, aspect of it. And so, um, so faith comes by hearing and hearing by what? The Word of God. So if we're not listening with our spiritual ears, then we can't grow in our faith and understanding of God's Word. So that's kind of the idea here, I think, in this passage. They're, they're just not listening. And here he is in the future verses going to talk about types and antitypes, the tabernacle on earth and the tabernacle in heaven. You know, uh, Jesus' role as high priest and if he can't get them past this, it's going to be hard for them to understand. And some of that's even hard for us to understand, the types and antitypes. You know what that is? There's a type of Christ in the Old Testament. Pick one. Huh? Okay, Adam, Moses, Joshua was a type of Christ, Joseph, and... And so in the New Testament, we see the anti-type. So there's a type in the Old Testament. There's an anti-type in the New Testament. And we'll be getting into that uh, in future lessons. But, but we just need to kind of wrap our mind around that. And I get the impression that he feels like, the writer feels like, they're not getting it. They're not understanding. He talked about the superiority of Christ. Now he's going deeper in, in trying to explain the priesthood and um, these types and antitypes. Anything else on that? Yep, go ahead. He also explained it in telling them that they have, they've stopped exercising their knowledge. They've stopped. <clears throat> they were content with what the milk of the world was. You can't build on what you don't know. And so they, they were relying on the fact they were Hebrews, uh, and they stopped. And so, he, what is he going to talk to? Them? I mean, he explains what it is, what their problem is. I yes. can't choke down solid food if you're barely drinking water or milk. Steve, what happens if you don't exercise? And you just keep eating? I think we all know. Okay. <laughs> and, and, and so, just, you know, much of what happens physically, we can think of spiritually. If we're not exercising our mind and not uh, applying God's word in our life, we're going to get lazy about our thinking and how, how, we, how we understand things. And so we have to exercise uh, our minds. And, you know, I think, I think it, we'll just jump into this this last question here, but um, but we think about the expectation. We see here an expectation that he had for them. The expectation was what? You're here, where do you need to be? Here. You're a child, you need to be an adult. You know, there, there comes a time where, you know, a baby becomes a a child and eventually becomes an adult, right? And, and we would expect that progression. What happens if a baby stays a baby or doesn't eat anything but milk? Something's wrong. There's going to be serious problems. And so, so when we think about uh, this lesson, this idea spiritually, we have to bec become skilled, experienced, we have to feed on meat and not just milk. We have to go beyond the elementary principles. When you think about 
elementary principles, what kind of things do you think about? It gets into it more in the next chapter, but what do you think? I mean, we, we understand what it means to be baptized. I mean, what, th those are first principles, right? We understand what belief is and, and repentance and, and some of those things. We understand that. What would be considered more meat? Solid food. What do you think? How to apply those things. Huh? How to apply those things. What okay. does that mean and how do I... Are you talking about revelations or are you talking Well, about that could be an example, people? right? Revelation is... I mean, it's kind of deep, right? The first part's okay, but then it just it, it gets, you know, deeper as you go through it. But it's something that we can understand, but if, if we want to progress in God's word, then, then we're going to have to start digging into it. Hebrews can be a little bit deep as we get to the latter types, anti-types, and that kind of stuff. Uh, Galatians can be. Romans, we're studying that. That can be a little gnarly in spots. And so, but that's why we study, because we want to feed on the meat of God's word, not just the milk. And so we have to have a balance of that, right? We have younger Christians, we have older, more mature Christians. How do you strike the balance in, in the, the teaching program, at, like the, this church, between the meat and the milk and, and uh, doing that? So I want us to think about this as, as we close. What would be a picture of someone that is spiritually immature versus someone that's mature? And I wrote these, these points down just to get us to thinking about this. A, spiritually, a picture of a spiritually immature person. They have malice. They have envy, guile, hypocrisy, evil speaking. 1 Peter 2 talks about babes in Christ. And unable to give a defense of the gospel. I mean, at some point, you have to defend your faith. Why do you believe what you believe? When you're a younger Christian, it's a little bit more challenging because you don't know as much. But as we get older, we should. Giving a defense of the gospel. Being tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. I mean, oh, that sounds good. Yeah, no, th but that's not right. How do we know? So we have to be rooted and grounded in God's word. So these are the kind of things when you think about spiritual immaturity, what, what we should think about. A picture of someone who is spiritually mature is someone that has that intense desire to feed on the milk and the meat of God's word. And um, teaching and converting people to the gospel. You think about more mature people doing that. Passing the many tests and trials whether physical or emotional or physical, whatever the case may be. Engaged in the fruit of the Spirit. Another, you know, again, picture of a mature person being transformed by the renewing of our mind and, and, and testing those things to know that they're true. So, so when we think about, I'll just wrap up with this passage here. Uh, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. It says, and again, think about maturity. All scripture is breathed out from God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So when we think about spiritual maturity, this passage gets right at it. That's our goal, is to be perfectly complete as Christ. And that's what Hebrews talked about, was how he learned obedience and became the perfect fit for our salvation. But the path to that goal is through the scriptures, which is what we're doing now. And as we study, we must obey. And if you go back to Hebrews 5 and verse 8, when it says obey, that's present tense. It's active. It doesn't mean 
as obeyed in the past. It means you're continuing to obey. And so we must continue to obey and, and follow our, in our Lord and our King and our high priest steps. That's what we're to do. We're priests in, this, in his kingdom. He's our high priest. And so we'll leave it there. Anything else before we wrap up?